In the previous example, we looked at a very simple random variable that only took on values 0 and 1. Now let's see if we can extend the same analysis to random variables that take on more values. And suppose the question is, we have a random variable that can take on many possible values, and we want to estimate what the entire probability mass function, what's the entire probability distribution for that random variable. How do we do that? So how do we set it up? We say x is a random variable, xi are iid distributed according to x. So what this means here is that xi are iid random variables, and their distribution is according to the same distribution that x has. But we don't know the distribution x has. So the probability that x equals i is unknown. So we don't know what the distribution of x is. Do we need to know something? Let's start with some basic thing that we know. Suppose we know what the range of possible values is. So we know the, say, L possible values that x could take. So we know what the alphabet is, what kind of values that x can take is, but we don't know what the distribution is. We're going to estimate that from data. So we want a bunch of numbers, pi's, which are the probability that x equals i. This is what we want. And what's our estimator going to be? So again, let's go with a simple estimator. Let's go for the average. Well, the average of what? Well, the average of the number of times that i comes up. So let's make that more formal. To make this more formal, we're going to use indicator random variables. So let the indicator random variable 1 sub i evaluated at index j. Let's think of this as being a random variable, which is equal to 1 if x sub j equals i and 0 otherwise. So these are clearly indicator random variables. And their iid across j. As you vary j, these are iid, independent and identically distributed. Why are they independent? They're independent because the x j's are independent, and they're identically distributed because all the x uh, j's are also identically distributed. So you have these random variables. Given these random variables, let the estimate for i be just the average of them. So average of which ones? Well, indicators that are looking for i. I'm not going to sum over i, I'm going to sum over j of j. So you have this very simple averaging estimator. This estimator will tell us the different p hats for the different possible values that x can take. And so what do we want? Right? We want this to be good. What should good mean here? So what is good enough? Well, let's start by understanding what we want is the estimate, which is a random variable, minus the true, which is an unknown constant. This should be small, less than some r, let's say. r is our tolerance. But we don't want this to be true for just one i. This has to be true for all i simultaneously. So when we have our estimate within r of the truth for every single i, so if x can take on one of seven possible values, this should be true for each of those seven possible values. 
then we'll say that we have a good enough estimate. So the question is, for example, how can we find an n that is large enough so the probability of good enough is at least say 90%. This is the question. So this question turns around the question we had before. We wanted to find uh, the confidence, this 90% number. So here I'm going to say the confidence is given. As is the tolerance. And we want to find n, the number of samples. How do we do this? So the first thing we look at this problem is we look at it and we say, well, what could go wrong? Lots of different random variables here. Well, the first thing that can go wrong from your first intuition is that, well, maybe you get many of these right, but some one of them wrong. So it's not enough to guarantee this for a few of them. You have to guarantee this for every single one. And maybe that's going to impinge on us somehow. The other thing that bothers you when you look at this is you ask about independence. Well, you know that the these are independent. These indicator random variables are independent as you vary j. But they're not independent as you vary i. In fact, definitely not so. Because remember, if it's equal to 1, it means that xj is equal to i, which means xj is definitely not equal to i plus 1. So knowing something about one of these indicators tells you something about the others. So this. Uh, condition here of how we define these indicator random variables tells us that these estimates here, these p hat i's, are not independent of each other. For different i's, they actually have some dependent structure. So we don't have the independence among these random variables. We still need to proceed. So what do we do? Well, we look at it and we say, try to follow the technique we did before. We say, we're good enough. To understand the probability of being good enough, we have to look at the probability of being not good enough. So we're interested in finding out something about the probability of being not good enough. Now, we would like to get an upper bound on this probability, an upper bound on this probability. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, well, if we're not good enough, we could be not good enough on 1, we could be not good enough on 2, could be not good enough on 3, could be not good enough on 4, all the way up to the L possible values. So this feels like a union. This event of being not good enough is a union of a bunch of, dis of dis separate events. Now, these events might not be disjoint. You could be messed up on one and two simultaneously. But even then, the union bound applies. Remember, what the union bound says is that this probability, whatever it is, is certainly less than or equal to the sum from i equals 1 to l of the probability that we mess up on that particular estimate. So the probability, not, uh, probability of being not good enough is certainly less than or equal to this sum. So now we're in good shape, right? Because these p hat i's, this is like the previous problem we just did. So we can apply Chebyshev's inequality inside here and say that by Chebyshev's inequality, all this is less than or equal to sum i equals 1 to l of what? pi 1 minus pi, that's the variance, divided by n times r squared. So we have an expression. Now let's pull out the terms that don't depend on i at all. 1 over nr squared. And we're left with the sum inside, i equals 1 to l, of pi 1 minus pi. So again, we find ourselves in the same situation we were in before. We would like to assert something about an n that's big enough so that this whole expression is definitely less than or equal to 0 0.1, 10%, which is the 
you know, 1 minus 90%. But we don't know these PIs. They're the unknowns. So how do we deal with this? Well, the question really becomes, if you look at this guy and say, how big could this be? Now, is it constrained? Yeah, of course it's constrained. It's constrained by all the PIs have to be greater than or equal to zero. And of course, the sum of the PIs has to equal one. But still, the question remains, how big could it be? Now, to answer this question, let me give myself some more room. We have a couple of possibilities. The first possibility is just to hack our way uh, and attack this problem. So if we hack and attack this problem, we say, well, it's kind of annoying that all these PIs are actually coupled to each other. So let's just decouple them. So we'll call this hack1. Decouple the PIs. Well, if we decouple the PIs, we eliminate this constraint that they have, then we know that PI1 minus PI is less than or equal to 1 quarter. This is definitely true. And so the probability of being not good enough is less than or equal to 1 over nr squared times L times 1 quarter. Right? We have L terms in the sum. Each one is less than or equal to 1 quarter. So we get this bound. This is really easy to calculate. Now we'll re revisit later whether it's a good bound or not. But it's really easy. So we take this bound and we say, hey, let's look at this bound and let's see what, it, what it's like. We want to say this thing is less than or equal to 0 0.1. And from that, we can conclude that n should be greater than or equal to l over 4. That's from here. Times 1 over r squared. That's from here. Times 10 from 1 over this. So this is certainly a safe bound. So let's try a value. If r, the tolerance, is 0 0.1, then it's telling us that an n that's greater than or equal to 250 times l, the number of possible values that the random variable can take, this is certainly safe. So it works. It gives us a bound. It gives us a safe value of n. Now, when you look at it, this n is scaling linearly in L. Is this good or is this bad? It's kind of hard to tell looking at it. Of course, it would be much nicer to have a bound that you know did not have linear scaling, that had something better than linear scaling. But you know it is a bound and it does work. So how would you attack this problem without going through this particular hack. Is there another way? So let's look at that next. So in the second approach, we're going to ask ourselves, well, how big could this really be? So what is the max of the sum? i equals 1 to l, pi 1 minus pi, where this maximization is over the constraints, pi greater than or equal to 0 and sum of the PIs equals 1. Well, this is a maximization problem. It's a maximization problem over a bunch of different Ps subject to some constraint. So is there any hope of this succeeding? Well, you look at this and you remind yourself, wait a minute, this thing here, this is a concave function. Remember, concave means it looks like that. And this whole thing is a sum of concave functions. And the sums of concave functions are themselves concave. This is the basic property of convexity concavity.
Now, this is a sum of concave functions. You want to maximize them. So look at the shape here, right? This is to remind you, concave functions, they like being maximized. They like being maximized over nice domains. So is this a nice domain or not? Well, this is clearly a convex set. Remember, what does convex mean for a set? Convex sets are those such that any linear combinations of points that are in here, that are convex combinations, namely you start at one point inside the set and you move towards another point inside the set. Convex sets are such that when you go through that motion, you never leave the set. And this is pretty clear, right? If you start with numbers that are greater than or equal to zero, then no amount of adding them together is going to get you a number that's less than zero. Similarly, if you obey the constraint that the sum of the pi is equal to 1, no amount of moving from one point to another is going to change that. You're never going to start violating that constraint. So this is a convex set. Now, when you maximize a concave function over a convex set, there will be exactly one local maximum, and that local maximum will be the global maximum. So using the stuff that we learned in calculus, when you try to maximize a function like this, subject to a constraint like this, what do you do? One possibility is you can sort of use Lagrange multipliers. You have this one equality constraint, so Lagrange multipliers. The method of Lagrange multipliers will tell us that maximize the following function. the original function with a Lagrange multiplier on the constraint. Yeah, we don't have to worry about the what the constraint is equal to. That, that's not going to matter. So you want to maximize this. So you can take derivatives. Take them with respect to pi. And then set to 0. Well, what do you get when you take the derivative? Well, the derivative of this with respect to pi is going to be 1 for the pi minus 2 pi. Then what's the derivative of this with respect to the pi? Well, you're just getting it a mu. I think set it equal to 0. And this is going to hold for every i. Because when you take respect, derivative with respect to pi, you get the same answer no matter what i you use. That tells you that, in fact, from here, you can conclude that since this mu is common across each one of those, that all pi's are equal at the max. At that point, you are in really good shape. All the pi's are equal at the max. You know exactly what they're going to be. The optimizing pi's are just 1 over L. Now we can simply evaluate what this max is equal to. Plug in. So pi is 1 over l, 1 over l, times 1 minus 1 over l. So you have the sum of l terms of 1 over l times 1 minus 1 over l. This is just equal to 1 minus 1 over l. So this is really interesting, because unlike what we were asserting before here, when we said how big could it be, we said, well, maybe it could be as big as l over 4. Here, we're getting something much better. We're saying the biggest thing this thing could ever be is 1 minus 1 over L, which is certainly less than or equal to 1. So if we plug this bound in, we get that the probability of being not good enough is less than or equal to 1 over nr squared 
times 1. Right? Remember, we're taking this bound here and we're evaluating it with an upper bound. So for example, if you want to set this is to be less than or equal to 0 0.1, this implies that n's that are greater than or equal to 10 over r squared are safe. So again, if r is equal to 0 0.1, this says that as long as n is greater than or equal to 1,000, we're safe, in that we will get the right estimate meaning the estimate to within the tolerance of 0 0.1, no matter how large the range of possible values that x can take is, the probability for every single one of those, the probability mass function, will be within 0 0.1 of its uh, true value with probability 90%. So there's two things here, right? There's a tolerance, which is telling us how far away we are in our estimated probability from the actual probability. And the other is the confidence, which here is 90%, which tells us that when we do this experiment, as long as we take the requisite number n, most of the time we're going to get the right answer, meaning good enough.